We're going to start in one minute. I'm just uh, waiting for people to, um, for the system to allow people all in. Okay, let's, um, let's, uh, let's then get going. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. Before we begin, a word of thanks to everybody who made today happen, to WBUR for collaborating with us on this event, and to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel who made this possible. A special thank you to the frontline workers who may be watching for all you are doing during this difficult time and always. Today is part of a series of events we are hosting on the coronavirus. This pandemic is unfolding rapidly, giving little time to reflect. These events that we host weekly are meant to provide context as we look at the pandemic through the lens of contemporary public health issues. COVID-19 is not just a disease, it is a story, one that is told primarily through the media. Engaging with this narrative is an important part of addressing this crisis. The media communicates key facts about the disease, helping coordinate our response. Media exposure can directly influence mental health, informing how we process this trauma. And the media shapes where we apply our focus in building a healthier world one where pandemics like COVID-19 can no longer emerge. We are truly fortunate today to have with us an expert panel to guide our conversation about COVID-19 and the media. Each panelist will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then I shall moderate questions from the audience. Please feel free to use the question tab in your Zoom browser, and I will do my best to get to as many questions as we can. Our first speaker is Margaret Lowe, Chief Executive Officer at WBUR. Margaret. Thank you so much, Dr. Galea. I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity to be part of this seven seminar along with such distinguished colleagues. And, I, and I'm also really pleased that BUR is collaborating with the School of Public Health on this effort. My charge today uh, was to talk about the, the central role of media during this once in a generation crisis. And I've devoted my entire professional life to journalism and this is by far the biggest story of my career. It's global, it's national, and it's so intensely local. Just to provide you some context, I actually walked into the door of BUR on a Monday morning in mid-January. It was 100 days ago yesterday, and I was the brand new CEO, just a little more than six weeks uh, into the job. Uh, at the end of February, I sent out my very first coronavirus note to everyone at the station, around 250 people. And I just thought I should let the staff know that we were paying attention and that we were gonna quickly form a task force to enable us to respond to what was unfolding. And like so many people, I had no idea how fast things would evolve. Within 10 days, we were moving almost the entire staff out of the building and flooding the zone on the story, which has, galvanize my colleagues in a profound way. So every BUR journalist is on this story, no matter what their beat. They were suddenly covering the coronavirus. And what of course was so different was that like everyone, we were all living it or are all living it too. So even as our own lives were turned upside down, our journalists had to figure out how to stay on the story while working from home, dealing with all the crazy complexity of our new reality. They began creating DIY audio production studios. They couldn't come in close contact with the people they were interviewing. So in order to get the story, they had to get very inventive, very, very fast, and they did. And I think the good news for us in this is that when there's so much loss of lives, of jobs, loss of control, uh, the ability to do something that matters in people's lives right now feels really meaningful to all of us. I was actually talking to a physician who serves on our task force and is on the front lines of this pandemic and I thanked him for what he was doing. And he said, Margaret, you and the BUR team are as essential as we are. We could not do what we do without your reporting the story. People wouldn't have the information they need. And that, I think, is exactly where the media's role in this public health crisis becomes so critical. And, and Dr. Galea, one of the things you've been writing about and that we've been reporting on is the mental health implications of this pandemic. And audiences are incredibly hungry for information as we're all really trying to comprehend the enormity of what is happening and what's unfolding. People are isolated in their homes, away from family, friends, colleagues, and they're longing for connection to one another and for deep 
and we hope reliable information. So we've tried to do that in sound and pictures and words. Our role as journalists really is to be the eyes and ears for the audience and more than ever to be a vital public service like hundreds of public radio stations across the country were deeply embedded in our communities. And this is really a moment, I believe, for public radio like no other. It's global, it's national, and it's local. So uh, I wanna give you some insight on what we're doing. I'm gonna share my screen, which might take a minute. So we've spun up daily coronavirus emails with the latest news from City Hall, the State House, the numbers, which as we all know are rising at a staggering rate. The state's plan to do contract tracing, the decision to close schools until the end of the school year, effectively breaking news updates. We've created maps and charts laying out what's unfolding in Massachusetts. It's constantly updated with uh, town by town data. We're taking questions from our audience and ask, answering them on air and online. We produced a guide uh, to navigating coronavirus, everything from how to wash your hands to where to get tested, and importantly, how to manage the emotional challenges of social distancing. Uh, this is one of my favorites. We created a pop culture care package, crafting DIY comfort on cooking, on sewing, doing tie dye, um, importantly, we launched a series of online town halls. So every Tuesday night, uh, much like what you're doing here, Dean, this is our health and science correspondent, Kerry Goldberg with Kevin Tab. He's the president and CEO of Beth Israel Leahy Health. And importantly, one of the issues Tab talked about the other night was the precipitous decline of uh, people coming in for non-COVID but vital medical treatment, cancer, heart, et cetera. And he used the BUR town hall to talk about the urgency of this issue and to get the word out that hospitals are open for business and that it is safe and critically important to come. And our, our purpose in these town halls is to connect with healthcare leaders and with one another and give access to our journalists and to the experts, workers on the front lines of this pandemic and we believe this is another very important way we can help people navigate this experience. And we've been covering this story with editorial rigor and with all the intensity that it requires. Some quick examples. We broke the story of the Pine Street Inn where testing revealed a stunning asymptomatic coronavirus spread among Boston's homeless population. Out of 397 people tested, 146 people came up positive. That was one of a, more than a third of those tested. And incredibly, none of those 146 people were showing any symptoms, which means they were shedding and contagious. And our reporting and this revelation underscored the critical need for, for broad testing. We reported on how healthcare workers are isolating from their families and the daily fear they live with of exposing their loved ones to the virus. Another critical storyline in this pandemic is how disproportionately it's affecting people of color, like in Chelsea, which is majority Latino and where much of the labor force there are essential employees. And these are people who don't have the luxury of working from home. We reported the story of Amanda Joyce. She's a nurse who works on the labor and delivery floor at Newton Wellesley Hospital and is now a COVID-19 patient herself and she's pregnant. Uh, our reporter, Martha Biebinger, who reported the story, told me this morning that Amanda got a negative test this past Monday, but another test just came back positive. And as you may know, the CDC recommends two negative tests to confirm that someone can be cleared from isolation. And Amanda uh, told Martha that her ability to smell is still only 75% back. She's still getting winded with minor chores around the house, and she still gets low-grade temps, but she told us that she's trying really hard not to check too much. We did a beautiful piece on sitting Shiva and how mourning the dead has changed. One of the real cruelties of this disease is that in addition to the loss of so much life, we're not able to grieve in the way that we're accustomed to. And yet as the disease robs families of the chance to gather after a loss, people are finding new ways to mourn collectively and to find real strength and comfort in one another. 
And I love this photo from earlier this week. This was on Patriot's Day. We have two photographers covering this story in very powerful pictures. This is actually a photo from Hump Hump Hopkinton, Hopkinton Town Center on Monday morning where the Boston Marathon would of course normally begin. And you can see one lone runner still training and a masked bronze statue depicting a local uh, with a fire starter's pist pistol. Um, what's clear uh, from all this is that we're not just a source of news and information. We're a real source for people of comfort and connection. And here is some of what we're hearing. You're a lifeline to reality, said Marjorie, who tweeted at us, or this. Folks, I live alone and my radio is tuned to WBUR every day. I can't tell you what you mean to me and not just for your ample, valuable, reliable information, but for your courage and steadfastness. I experience each and every one of you as a well-known friend and support. And this one, bless all of you at BUR for your brilliant reporting, for your perseverance at getting the details and the facts straight, and for bringing the hardest and also the most hopeful story to my ear. Just hearing your kind and familiar voice brings calm to my day, cheering you on. At the same time as we need to keep our journalists and the entire staff feeling tethered to one another to help sustain our mission and our service, this is John Kane, our properly mass senior producer of All Things Considered, still working at the station along with a handful of others we call the at-bat team. The on-deck team uh, is still waiting safely in the rings, ready to spring into action if we need to move the at-bat team due out due to illness. I, I love that picture of John. Um, and in an effort to stay connected for the last six weeks, I've been sending out daily updates to our team. This is a combination of vital information, missives from our colleagues, and photos like these where our Radio Boston producer, Jamie Bologna, shared pics of working at home with his very young colleague, Anthony Bologna, and also pics, pics of his uh, pasta reserve stockpile. We've just we've noticed a trend that there is a lot of talking about food. I think it is one of life's, life's greatest and most reliable pleasures and, and deep comforts, especially at a time like these. And these daily notes that we've been sending, I know have helped tie our team together. And then each week uh, we gather for a BUR Ask Me Anything where we all see one another via Zoom, of course. And sometimes we have speakers. I share updates and the staff gets to ask me anything. And I can promise you that they do. Um, not surprisingly these days, many of the questions are about our economics. Even while we double down on this story, of course, people are extremely concerned about their jobs because while journalism is such a vital public service, it's also being pummeled by the brutal economic impact of this vir virus. And I think everybody knows journalism was already being ravaged even before COVID-19 took hold. But in the last six weeks, tens of thousands of journalists have lost their jobs or been furloughed. And that's not an especially happy note to end on, but I think it's a really important one because as we know, Journalism uh, is not only vital to democracy, it is also vital to our public health, uh, especially now. Thank you, Margaret, that was terrific. Uh, next up, we have uh, Roxanne Cohen-Silver, Professor of Psychological Science, Medicine and Public Health at the University of California, Irvine. Roxy. Thank you, I'm gonna take a moment also to share my screen. Thank you very much. And I would very much like to thank the Boston University School of Public Health for inviting me to this very important session this afternoon. This is a very stressful time for our country and indeed our world. And we've all been through community traumas before. We've weathered mass violence, we've weathered natural disasters. And indeed my colleagues and I have studied such collective traumas for the last 30 years. Such events like the September 11th terrorist attacks, the Boston Marathon bombings, 
the Orlando nightclub shootings, school shootings, and hurricanes, Harvey and Irma, earthquakes, etc. And research tells us that most will get through these situations. Humans are quite resilient. But somehow, COVID-19 feels different. And in fact, I believe it is. And I'd like to share a few thoughts that I have about what makes COVID-19 so unique. First, it is an invisible threat. We don't know who is infected and for the re because people can shed the virus being when they are asymptomatic, it makes their threat particularly stressful. It's also a very ambiguous threat. We have no idea how bad this will get. We also have a very uncertain future. Although we keep asking how long is this gonna go on, we really don't have any idea how long this will last. And it's a global threat. No community is safe. And in fact, even on islands in the middle of the Pacific, individuals are getting COVID-19 and getting quite ill. And during this period of time now, we're spending a great deal of our time at home, often alone, and with the opportunity to engage with media, perhaps in ways that we never could before. And the media is a double-edged sword. We just heard a beautiful presentation about all the wonderful things that the media can do. And it is really quite important to recognize that during periods of high ambiguity and uncertainty, people seek out trusted information via the media. And we saw that when that is received, people are very, very thankful. People seek out risk assessments try to understand how are they at risk and in what ways can they protect themselves. People also, also seek out recommendations for what specifically they can do to protect themselves and others. Perceptions of risk and anxiety, in fact, rise when information is ineffectively communicated. But as we just saw, the media can provide critical guidance. However, there is an alternative side of the sword. We know from research that my colleagues and I have conducted that rumors and misinformation appear on social media because individuals can rapidly disseminate information that they receive on social media and there is no editor to vet the information for accuracy rumors and misinformation continue to spread. Moreover, overexposure to media can amplify stress with downstream mental and physical health effects. And over the next few minutes, I just would like to share with you some of the research that my colleagues and I have done that highlight how overexposure to the media First, we know that there are several health consequences of repeated media exposure. When people are repeatedly bombarded with bad news, they have increased perceptions of threat. We know that repeated exposure to news about a negative event, a collective trauma, can activate the acute stress response. And my colleagues and I found in the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing, that there was amplified stress for individuals who spent several hours engaged with the media, in fact, more so than the stress that was experienced by people who were at the Boston Marathon themselves. We also found after September 11th terrorist attacks that acute stress responses that were media driven were linked to new onset cardiovascular ailments over three years following the attacks. We also know very clearly from our research over the last 20 years that the amount of media exposure matters. And we've found that across all sources of media, about four hours of combined media exposure per day seems to be the critical point at which people now beyond that show 
some health consequences. For example, we found in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks that more than four hours of television exposure during the first week after the 9-11 attacks was associated with post-traumatic stress and new onset physical health problems two to three years later. We also found during the 2014 Ebola outbreak in the United States that more than four hours of daily media exposure to information about the Ebola outbreak was associated with increased distress, increased worry, and poor functioning. And this is in a national sample, nationally representative sample in the United States. We also know that the content of the media exposure matters. The extent to which it is graphic seems to promote more health consequences. We found that after the Boston Marathon bombings, early repeated exposure to graphic images was associated with worse mental health and worse functioning six months later. We also know from our research that media exposure can create a feedback loop of distress and greater exposure to media over time. My colleagues and I conducted a three-year longitudinal study of a nationally representative sample in which we looked at individuals who were first exposed to the Boston Marathon bombings and then over the three-year period were exposed to several other community-wide traumas, including the Orlando nightclub massacre. And we found that increased media in the early aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing was associated with anxiety and ongoing worry and ongoing distress over the next year and a half to two years, which led to increased exposure to the media, which again was associated with increased worry. And so we have a feedback loop that is very difficult to extricate oneself. So what are our recommendations? First, we recommend that the media should convey information to the extent possible without sensationalism and without disturbing images. And we just saw an excellent example of the ways to show pictures profoundly without being disturbing, without being sensational. We also encourage the public to limit repetitious exposure to media stories, to select authoritative outlets and monitor the amount of their exposure, not just among children, but among adults as well. We feel that it's important that the public should be wary of unverified reports that often are promoted on social media. And we also encourage healthcare providers to encourage amongst their patients and their clients tempered media consumption. I have a number of references that can be accessed and I'm assuming that this presentation will be available but if not, I can be reached at the following email address, and I'm happy to provide any information to anybody who would like to. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Silver. Um, the, all of these presentations will be fully archived on the website, so you'll be able to actually listen to this and see the slides. Uh, next up is uh, Professor Ilana Newman, a McFarland Professor of Psychology at the University of Tulsa. Ilana. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, I need help, so the her screen is. Um, can we, um, um, Meredith? Can we? Uh, there Thank we go. you. I'm about to share my screen. Thank you okay. all. Um, give me one second. Yep. Okay. Well, I again also want to thank. Uh, Thank you all for inviting me to participate, for the people who made this possible. I'm in the lucky role of um, working for the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. And I've worked with them for 20 years, and we're dedicated to the ethical reporting about trauma. And I get the great job of taking the important work um, of folks like Dr. Silver, uh, Dean Galeo, and translating that for journalists. 
and helping journalists understand best practice about traumatic stress. And with that in mind, what I thought I would do is tie together a little bit about the last two presentations, about we know, what we know about the impact of news, journalistic practice, public health. And my hope is to raise some questions and offer some practical advice for those of you in the audience who are researchers, who are news consumers, and direct care providers. Dr. Silver has just talked about what's so unique about this, as has Margaret Lowe in talking about the anxiety that we all experience right now living through this. We're experiencing many forms of distress, our general anxiety. We're also anticipating anxiety and we're anticipating grief. Our routines are disrupted in all sorts of ways as we've seen already, our health maintenance behaviors, our families, our community. And as we saw in that compelling story, when losses happen, our grief rituals are interrupted. So we have collective grief. And as Margaret also mentioned, we have this impact on employment. So we have many, many stressors and it's complicating the situation. And as Professor Silver has just pointed out, we know the news has an impact on people. Trauma-related news, COVID-19 news, it's distressing. In the work that I've done, in a meta-analysis, which is basically a numerical literature review, we have found a small but significant relationship in all the studies that have been done between media consumption, the amount, just as you heard, and lasting related distress. And you just got an example of that. And there is some evidence um, actually from the team that uh, Dean Gleit has done about that those exper experiencing direct loss may be more vulnerable. And that's still under debate, I would say, in the literature, there's some mixed evidence. So it has an impact. And now we need to talk about, well, what do we do with that? And before we do that, I wanna just say the implications of that is there are a lot of hypotheses. In fact, there may be this feedback loop that you just heard about from Professor Silver. Is news acting as a traumatic reminder or a depressive reminder making symptoms more salient. Is it the case that people who are affected by the event, who have PTSD, who have depression, access more news? And what are the implications for journalists and for audience if you're that person? And what is the implication for newsmakers if the people seeking out that information may be the most vulnerable? The same case goes for children. What's going on with families? And I will mention children a little bit more, some other reason. And it's my belief at this point that news does not cause long lasting problems in and of itself, but it does have a contribution and a small one, but a significant one. And we need as a community to start talking about, well, what does that mean for all our stakeholders? You've just seen, I'll go through this quickly, the roles of journalists in mass disaster. They provide incredibly important information at the beforehand, during, and after. They provide ways for us to have analysis um, and come up with a collective narrative about this important event. In some cases, um, they are our crisis communicators when our public officials fail us. Starting now, and I think ongoing, they are going to be our public watchdogs, monitoring those in power who made choices, providing us with that verified information that we all see is helpful. I think what you also just saw for public radio, but I think for many, is that journalists provide a public dialogue and a way to engage. One of the things we know how people cover, recover from mass disasters through some kind of social support and feeling part of the community. And journalists provide us with that collective community and voice. And of course, they provide the first draft of history. Yet we sometimes think about journalists as hearing all evil, seeing all evil, and posting all evil. And sometimes we blame the messengers. And I think we have to be careful. And although I won't be talking too much about the occupational health of journalists, which I study, is that this is such challenging work for journalists. And Margaret's just really explained a lot of this. This is a whole, all hands on deck, all beats. Everyone has become a COVID-19 reporter. Whether you're doing fashion, <laughs> doesn't matter what you're doing, it has an impact. The social distancing we're experiencing is difficult in of itself. And 
Um, it's also making it very hard, particularly photographers, but I would say lots of people. Some people are used to working remotely, some aren't. Fact changes. There are many practices that have needed to be innovative, as you just heard. And there are emotional aspects of being part of the story and trying to figure out your boundaries. Experts are also busy responding. All these stories on, on physicians, they're not always available to respond because they're doing important work. I've just been working with some journalists who talk about their ambivalence about accessing people who are in the field wanting to tell their stories, but also feeling like I don't want to interrupt. People are concerned about talking to those who are directly facing that, those events. Could I in some way upset the sources that I'm talking to? And I think the challenge of journalism is that um, this is an uncertain time and telling stories about uncertainty is hard work and it's not always in the toolbox. And I just wanna say again that journalists, the ones that I speak to and I speak to them often wanna do no harm and help and it is a public service, as you heard. At the same time, their role is not to be a doctor or to be a public health communicator, but through their lens and through their ethical responsibilities to tell accurate, proportional information using their craft and using their tools. And I have great respect for that. So, I just want to say that I really have been taking a hard look at journalists. And as we've heard, I think of journalists as first on the scene and some of the people who are first responders who need attention and are taking risks that are really important. And news agencies are deciding what stories are worth people taking personal risks for. What we don't know is, and the research is mixed, is we don't know that much about what community narratives are helpful and beneficial to the public health in general. We have people who say, I like that story. We have people who say, I love this. But the science doesn't tell us what the best narratives are. Same thing with the narratives that are resented or harmful for public health. We have some information from the framing literature on mass disasters that context is particularly important um, and that news stories that have context provide meaning and are helpful. It's not always clear that consumers want context. Sometimes they want to go straight for the facts and the information. So there's a issue there, I think, of balancing. And I would love to hear what the other panelists have to say about narratives, because I think this is really something we really need to look at, is what are the stories we're telling? Storytelling is really important. What does it mean? My opinion with some data support is that we want stories that people want to access, but not access too much, as Dr. Silver just said. Finding that balance. We want accurate stories for sure. That's a shared value. And there have been studies done with sources who are trauma exposed who said the number one thing was accuracy. Getting someone's name wrong, that's not acceptable. Accuracy is there. Not sensationalized, ethical, the reason I raise ethical is that ethical journalists also, being an ethical journalist also helps their own resilience and their own health. Ethics is important. The context, those things that suggest tangible actions and resources, like that guide you just saw. And that comes from a variety of literatures. And those stories that create understanding, empathy, and community. And I would love to hear what other people have to say about it. Now I want to just close with a few recommendations, and I don't recommend the following. What I do recommend is those of you in the audience who are professionals, please help journalists as you're able and your expertise and time allow. In the future, build relationships, particularly with your local journalists. Tell them about what you're doing. They may not always cover it. They pitch ideas. Tell them what you're doing. Trust them. Again, I think it's really important that professionals collaborate and not force. And I wanna say that again and again, we provide information that journalists then can synthesize. Respond quickly when asked. The journalist wants to talk to you and if you can't talk to them, tell them that quickly so that they can go on. Have public statements ready for breaking news. Invite them to events, not necessarily to cover those events, but to develop ideas. Of course, the DART Center has lots of resources. For those of you who are direct clinical care providers, 
Dr. Silver just talked about this. I think it's important to assess, are your clients watching a lot of news or a little news? That should be part of a clinical assessment during a mass disaster during this time. Provide advice about news um, intake. And also consider reaching out to the journalists in your community for their needs. As news consumers, those of you in the audience, what I'd like to encourage you to do is think about your news consumption thoughtfully. What do you need to know? Who do you need to know it from? And when do you need to know it? I spend a lot of time reading news. I have a ritual now or a routine. I watch it in the morning, I watch it around dinner time, and I do not watch it before bed. No news before 90 or no bedlam before bed. It is not a good idea and sleep is really important in these times for all of us. So thinking about what is it that I wanna know? How much do I need to know and when do I need to know it? Ask for sensitive coverage. When you see good coverage, compliment journalists. They hear all the complaints. They don't hear when it's done well, please compliment. You can see that that's really important. And as I've been talking to journalists, when they are stressed, many of them take out that compliment as a way of giving them meaning and keeping them on course. That is something we can do, it's public. Write letters to the editor commenting on what you like, what you don't like, the important things. I think all of us, and that's for professionals as well, should correct misinformation or bias when we see it. And finally, I wanna make a couple of comments about researchers. The research that's done has been incredible. And as I said, two of my colleagues right here are the people who've created it. We do need better measurement and specification. Um, the best information is, at this point, four hours, and it all comes from Dr. Silver's lab. Not everybody's measuring amount consistently. Most people are looking at television and not other kinds of events. We need to disaggregate, and again, there are exceptions, those are directly experiencing the losses of an event from those who aren't. We need to be looking at social media separate from news media, and people are doing that. And I hope someday we'll be able to directly measure what people are accessing on TV, what they're accessing on radio, because we're not getting direct amounts. We're getting people's reports of those amounts. When we're looking at children, we need to be looking both at children and, um, and the caretakers reports because those differ widely and you get different results when you look at the impact. The other thing we need to do is measure level of distress and impairment. It is my view, and I don't think I've said this before, is that this news is distressing. We are living in a distressing time, and I think that it is a normative moral response to be upset by what's going on in the world. And we have to convey that to our community. And I don't want it to be intolerable, and that's when we need to help. But some amount of distress is healthy. And what I think we need to do a little bit better in the research literature is indicate when it is normative distress and when it is high distress. And some researchers are doing that and some aren't. And finally, I think we also need to look at what's the positive aspects of news consumption. And as we, I hope we can talk about it, there are many. There are a few studies on survivor groups, but not more generally. And I think we need to be doing that and essentially looking at what narratives are helpful for whom at what time. Last thing I wanna say, and just to introduce children to the conversation, is that children are attentive to news. It's clear that age does affect what is distressing. The few studies that have been done show that younger children retain images. Older, it's the context of what's being said. We don't know for children yet what form of media uh, or of news, written internet or television, what is affecting them. But I think the evidence um, from Comer is that it's important that caretakers talk with their children about the news. And there are some uh, beginning programs that look that have an evidence base with coping and media literacy. And uh, parents, caretakers uh, should be provided with advice about strategies of talking developmentally appropriately to their kids. Um, and then the last thing I'll put in there, researchers really looking at children more. And then finally, journalists, I think that is a news consumer group that has been neglected um, and that we need to be thinking about news for kids. So hopefully I have tied this together well so that we can 
move on and talk about the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Newman. And uh, last but definitely not least, we have um, Dean Maria de Cristina, Dean of the Boston University College of Communication, my colleague, Dean de Cristina. Thank you so much, Dean Maria, and also to the other panelists. I've really found your comments so so interesting and also inspiring in many ways. And before I share my screen, I just wanted to recount a quick anecdote. <clears throat> I was um, speaking with a family member recently, and um, this is a smart, college-educated person who ran a book publishing division for a major national and international uh, brand. And we got to talking about, as, as one will do, our, our media consumption and, and how we were doing in uh, you know, physical distancing and so on. And uh, she said, Marriott, I, I have a question for you as a, as a science journalist. And I should have said, I've, I've been a science journalist myself for, for 30 years, only got to the College of Communication eight months ago. So I'm quite a new dean, uh, but a bit of an old science journalist. And she said, what, what should I make of stories that I'm seeing in my news feed about how uh, the coronavirus uh, was a bioweapon made in China. And it really brought home for me again, very forcefully, how very difficult it is with the constant influx of information, some good, some not good, how hard it is even for uh, any of us to tell sometimes uh, what's true and what's not. And that, that sort of frames the, the backdrop of, of, of my remarks today. I'm just gonna share my screen Hopefully you can all see that now. Um, my charge was to talk a little bit about how to think of the role of media in the future. And I thought I would provide just a little bit more context on the, the media industry and what's been going on and some ways that news media practitioners, journalists and, and others, and also the rest of us can participate to try to make a more mentally healthy ecosystem while we're at it. There we go. So what's been going on? I got the idea for this uh, sort of context slide from Joan Donovan, who is the research director at the Shorenstein Stancer Center at Harvard Kennedy School, who spoke to us at the College of Communication on, on Tuesday about misinformation in a quarantine era. Anyway, I just thought it would be useful to point out that there are a couple of kinds of falsities that are flying around the web. One of them is misinformation. These are mistaken ideas that are passed around often by well-intentioned people, um, you know, and we've all seen plenty of those. And then there are disinformation campaigns, which are organized campaigns of, of false information meant to serve a particular political or other communication end. And that all of us are subject to these both, but so are journalists. In fact, there are many times uh, I've heard of concerted efforts to, uh, to falsely, you know, um, pretend to give a journalist a story that's an exclusive, but it's a false one. And um, I've, I found that quite, quite distressing. So in addition to their other challenges, they're, they're wrestling with that. The WHO, the World Health Organization in February, dubbed this the infodemic, the overabundance of information, some accurate and some not. That makes it truly hard for people to discover what's, what's true and what's not. And just at the right is a, a picture of a few issues of my morning newspaper that I, uh, that I have been snapping over time just because I'm, I'm really struck by all of these. Now, Margaret Lowe talked a bit about this and so have our other speakers, but it's really this, the coronavirus storm is the story and it's hitting all the news outlets <clears throat> in ways that force everybody to become a health reporter and not just day to day, but, but constantly in our 24 seven cycle. And, you know, Let's remind us here that rather than fact, for, you know, fake news, as it's sometimes been called, journalism is actually a, a, uh, you know, a cornerstone of our democratic society in providing truthful information. Far from being an enemy of the people, it's enshrined in the Bill of Rights. But the past decade and a half have seen enormous changes in the news industry for a lot of reasons. And what we've seen in, you know, in the coronavirus kind of as a crucible of that is the challenges of grappling with uncertainty in trying to cover this when you're not an expert. So education reporters, sports reporters, others are all uh, being called, brought to bear on various parts of coronavirus coverage of authority figures providing unhelpful or mixed messages. Um, traffic and views are rising just when 
revenues are evaporating and there's a lot of pressure on news outlets to provide, and for many good reasons, coronavirus coverage for free as well. And then there are news deserts and gaps in reliable local coverage just when that local coverage is needed and, and perhaps desired the most. Um, what's behind this, which we've, we've touched on here, is social media has become a primary source of noise and signal there. And we've, uh, in, in the interest of time, I won't belabor these because um, I would like to get to the conversation at the end. But one thing that's important about it is it highlights and accelerates you know, new ideas that may not be accurate. And influencers, as armchair epidemiologists, can drown out expert voices very easily. It also has the effect, which we haven't talked about, of trapping us in uh, echo chamber-like bubbles where ideas that are maybe conspiracy theory based or hyperpartisan get reinforcement through conformity. And last but not least, it's also been a challenge in social platforms, which I personally enjoy using, but they've drawn a lot of uh, media dollars, advertising and so on, dollars away from media, which further have depressed the ability of news media to answer to this challenge. I think I should, we should point out, we've talked about some of these and certainly I'm no expert, um, but we all have innate cognitive tendencies that sort of reinforce this unhappy cycle. We like information if we agree with it already, how we feel about someone. So we've, we've talked a little bit about trust so far. If we trust somebody, we're more likely to agree with what they're saying or disagree with it if we, if we don't trust them. If a first piece of information that comes out is not accurate, uh, it may nonetheless stick because of that, uh, the effect of overrelying, the anchoring effect of overrelying. And we believe that we are less likely than other people to suffer ill effects. So we've seen a lot of that in, in the coronavirus experience so far. There are many people who believe that if you just supply the facts, um, the so-called knowledge deficit model, you can get the news across. But the simple truth is here, or part of it, is that if people believe an expert like Dr. Fauci, it's not because they understand all of the peer-reviewed studies behind what he's saying. It's because they like him, they trust him, you know, maybe even they admire him. More on that in a minute. Well, I was thinking about, and we've actually already touched on a couple of the things the media can do going forward to try to promote better coverage of the coronavirus pandemic. And for me, this falls into two buckets. Um, largely speaking, we talked about a little bit about uh, fact gathering and then also storytelling, and I'll, I'll touch on both. You know, um, this almost feels a bit cruel to me to say, in a way, as a, as a longstanding journalism professional myself, and knowing, uh, you know, as I know personally, how stretched news outlets are, stretched so thin right now, they nonetheless have to resist the temptation to cut corners and consist and continue to be careful reporters and careful stewards of information, um, including fact checking. They have to avoid the temptation to be unreasonably uh, optimistic in covering preprints, you know, studies that have not yet gone fully through the peer review process for publication in a reliable scientific journal. And even when something has been published, it's always wise to cross check it with other experts before you go ahead with your deadline story. On the storytelling side, we've talked a little bit already about, you know, focusing on informing and not dramatizing, especially with uh, images that can be very disturbing. Um, we also, as a news media, have had to try to change long-standing journalism practices that were formed in a different era, but which are not constructive right now. Um, one of them is this idea, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping down the list a little bit, of, of equal time which came out of coverage, uh, FCC regulations in the 30s and coverage of, of politicians' different opinions. But there's not a need for equal time when the research shows otherwise and when the data show otherwise. And many journalists have, have learned this lesson at this point, but it was a, a tough lesson to learn and contributed to you know, another ongoing crisis in human you know, society now, which is a misunderstanding around global climate change. A, a good tone to take is, you know, we've talked about being ethical, uh, authentic, neutral, empathetic, and sober in our coverage of, of coronavirus. And, you know, when audiences decide whether or not to trust coverage, part of what they're assessing is, 
the journalists and reporters and the media outlets personal motivations it's not a bad thing to signal when you can um, why you're doing it because you believe in providing reliable authentic information that people can count on and and last i want to touch on in this slide you know early on in coverage of the current uh, political administration president's administration news outlets would repeat what the president said because that it was always newsworthy of what the president said, but wouldn't immediately give the context. And when that happened, sometimes you were promoting inaccurate information, even though you didn't mean to. Um, journalists have had to change many of their practices over time. As media consumers, we all bear a responsibility, at least uh, somewhat, not to add to the pando pandemonium of coverage. Um, you know, no, uh, no pandemonium before 90. <laughs> you know, we should try to be aware of our biases and while we're reading things that seem perhaps too good to be true, it'd be great to maintain skepticism and guard against our inner optimism and, and check it. You know, does, do, have other outlets covered it? Have, um, you know, have, does, the, does the article itself have the hallmarks of something believable? Um, don't just forward things you've read the headline of, read the whole story to make sure it's worth sharing. You should sign up for your local government and local media outlet sources. But when you're looking at their websites, try not to leave the comments. They're often disrupted by uh, you know, concerted efforts to promulgate uh, false messages or by trolls or bots. And when you're reading a story, does it, does it quote from institutions that you recognize and rely on? Is the URL something that looks like a, like a normal URL or does it have some weird characteristics to it? Um, there are some, some false representations of media outlets there with they have additional letters to them so you can tell that way. And also if you see um, unusual errors in a story that can signal that there are other factual problems as well like simple typos. I don't really have a good question for good answer for the question that I'm asking here, but I, but I thought it was worth flagging that if we don't work on these areas, um, it, it's going to be more and more difficult to ensure a functional society because if we can't trust the information we're all receiving, what can we trust? Um, on the first one, the idea, this idea of repurposing social media systems to provide the right information at the right time. There have been some interesting experiments recently. For instance, last month, Facebook uh, created the information info center where it's been um, collecting articles from media outlets that are reliable and it uh, has exposed about 2 billion people to more reliable health information through Facebook in that way. On the other hand, uh, there's the challenge of, of business models and how to, how to properly support the journalism. And one way that we're gonna need to wrestle with that is can, can we find a sustainable business relationship between these social platforms and between the uh, major media outlets and other media outlets? And last not least, uh, we'll need to find ways for tech companies to better police their own content. And by the way, um, if you're you know, appreciating the coverage you're reading and just remembering that many media outlets are offering their coronavirus coverage for free, if you like what you see, it would be great if you uh, maybe considered buying a subscription if you're able to do so or making a donation if you're able to do so. Um, last, I just, for the sake of the, the slides later, if you have uh, some a little additional time and want to dive in more, here are just a few other resources that you can consult. Thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you, everybody. Those were fantastic presentations. It's actually hard to think of uh, a more comprehensive set of four presentations around uh, media, social media, and health. Almost out of time. So I'm just going to ask one question, and then we're just going to go around lightning round all the speakers in sequence of May. And I'm trying to distill um, a, a lot of interesting questions from the audience. Our media consumption. We know what's the optimal way to consume enough and to consume the right media. What's one piece of advice that each of the panelists would have for the audience? I think a lot of questions you know, circle around issues of misinformation, watching too much, making sure we're informed, making sure we're informed appropriately. So just one question, one piece of advice from each panelist for the audience, how do we consume enough of the right media? Margaret. Um, I, it's, it, I actually, I think it was um, 
I think it may have been uh, Elena, I'm not sure, but somebody who talked about sort of consuming media in the morning and at night, or maybe it was Roxanne. Um, I, I actually think that it is, I mean, we have found ourselves at home reading and consuming all the time. And, and even at the dinner table, we have an adult, one of our adult, four adult children home with us. And we're trying desperately to get away from talking about it. And we, and we almost can't. And so I don't know that I have the right answer. I think probably the people participating in this panel and the people in the audience know what trustworthy media sources are. And I think uh, it's a matter of reading those that you know are providing good and factual information. I think what we're seeing in the South is a sort of a uh, an amplification of the issue of lack of news literacy, where people actually aren't reading um, trustworthy news and 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 are therefore opening up their states in a way that's quite dangerous. So I think we know we probably know what the trustworthy institutions are. I would say. Um, you know, Scientific American, NPR and Public Radio, Washington Post, the New York Times, there are many, many more, but there's some stalwarts who are just doing a first class job. And I would stick to those and I would try to read a book or do a puzzle or take a walk and just be a human being as much as humanly possible. A great advice. Thank you. Roxanne. Yes, well, I practice what I preach. Uh, I do not watch television. Uh, I do not engage in any social media. And I really do monitor my media consumption. That's not to say that every member of my household does the same. I think it is very difficult. I think that I can stay informed by a very monitored diet of media that I read. I read online news sources and I do that in very, very small bursts. I don't think that I'm any less informed than anyone else, but I do know that I engage in a lot less media than a lot of my friends and colleagues. And I think that that just helps me in being able to continue to, to, continue to do the kind of work that I do. Thank you for asking the question. Lana. Well, I guess I would go back to the um, things that I said, which is I ask, uh, what do you need to know? When do you need to know it? And how much, uh, in what format do you need to know it? And I think what I would also add is that right now for this particular time, I hope, it is no longer a breaking news story. And so it doesn't matter if you get the information an hour from now or three hours from now, right now, you can access that information. And I think that's a good reminder. It is not a breaking news story, although there will be pieces, um, and that we think about that, that we can regulate that and think very carefully about when do I want to know it? And I am someone who consumes a lot of media. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for the great question. I have three thoughts to share. First of all, engage with trustworthy media. And by that, I mean, is it kind of nonpartisan? You know, if something only has one viewpoint, you really should balance it against others. Um, second, I, I, I also do like to consume media, uh, but, uh, but I try to do it thoughtfully. And I try to uh, not let my own instincts Get you know get carried away with my own instincts as far as resharing or engaging overly. I try to try to keep a tiny bit of arm's length there. And third, the schedule is your friend. I like to time box my media consumption. I mostly take it early in the morning when I have my brain to sort it out all day long, so it doesn't bother me in the evening. So those three things for me. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I really learned a lot from you all. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for what you're doing every day. And so you're all doing really interesting work. And as a just as a citizen and as a scientist, as a consumer of what you do, thank you. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Everybody, stay well, stay safe. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.